they will treat it as such. Well, God spoke this to me, and you're telling me otherwise? Who are you to challenge God? So I think that it's, there's a lot of different nuance and complexity when it comes to you know, how, do we, how do we think through this. But we, we at least have to put it in the realm of fallibility. And that's really the issue. What is the infallible uh, interpretation? And that brings us to Tradition 1, where Tradition 1 says there is one infallible word. There's one infallible rule, and that is the word, the written word of God. All the reformers drew this distinction between the word unwritten and the word written because, I mean, it's right there in the Bible. God spoke to Abraham. Uh, God spoke to Moses before he wrote it down. The apostles declared the word of God before they wrote theirs down. But they say that this made it into this. Whereas um, the apostolic uh, faith uh, handed down to uh, the, the church that made it into the word of God is the rule of faith or the um, what we commonly call today the Apostles' Creed. So, uh, Tradition 1, this is Keith Matheson, he says, Tradition 1, Scripture is the sole source of revelation. So, God still doesn't uh, speak to us uh, today in, um, in, in this infallible way. God guides by His providence. God, God still is active, but there's no infallible uh, word from God other than the Scriptures. So the Scriptures are the sole source of revelation, saving revelation from God, to be interpreted in and by the church within the context of the rule of faith. So that's the classic definition of Tradition 1. The, the, the Word of God written, the Bible, is the sole infallible source of revelation. The sole infallible authority. But there are other authorities subordinate to the scriptures, and that is um, the exegetical tradition, that is a set of uh, beliefs drawn from the scriptures done with the church. That's tradition one. Okay, so how is that in distinction from Tradition Zero? Yes, Chris. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so it's just no... Uh, there's no corporate judgment of the church, or at least that, that's not as important as the individual judgment. Right. And so heretics will, will say, heretics, I mean, this is your, your typical heretic. Um, I know this is what the church has said, but this is the way I see it. And, um, you know, I have to believe what, what I'm seeing. And so tradition one, uh, the way tradition zero rejects tradition one is that the individual takes the individual's understanding of the word of God takes priority over the corporate judgment of the or understanding of the word of God. So that's that's the basic distinction there. Uh, and that sola, sola scriptura has been used to affirm tradition zero, uh, where. Sola Scriptura means no tradition, no exegetical tradition, uh, what I call a consensus of exegesis. Uh, the individual judgment of the individual takes priority over the corporate judgment of the church in exegetical matters. Uh, the individual has uh, the final right to interpret Scripture apart from others imposing anything on him. Uh, he's going he's gonna to be more suspicious of tradition in the sense of an exegetical tradition and must much less suspicious of his own ability to reason and understand and that's that's how this comes out uh, someone who holds to, to to tradition zero does not care to consult the conclusions from history of the church but is satisfied to rely on his own understanding it doesn't bother him that he arrives at different conclusions uh, than the majority of the church 
uh, his individual reasoning and judgment has more weight than the corporate judgment of the church. Um, when he thinks about the Holy Spirit, you think about the work of the Spirit. Now, don't answer this out loud, but you think about the word, work of the Spirit. What do you primarily think of? You primarily, th primarily think about how the Holy Spirit is in you and working in you individually? Is that the first thing that comes to your mind? Or is it how the Holy Spirit, yes, is in you individually, and there is a work individually, but how the Holy Spirit works through his church. The reformers emphasized the work of the Spirit in the church, corporately. When they thought about the Holy Spirit, they thought about that. Um, so, under Tradition Zero, the Spirit primarily works through the individual and not the church corporately. You'll hear this, it's between me and the Lord. This is between me and the Lord. The difference between Tradition One and Tradition Zero is... Uh, interpretation focused on the church, um, conclusions established and checked in a collective body and historically versus focused on the individual. Tradition one, okay, how has this been interpreted historically? What did the confession say? That has authority, uh, that has authority over the individual, albeit under the scriptures. Tradition two says the individual um, has authority over any sort of Tradition or exegetical tradition. What's that? I'm sorry, tradition zero. Yes. Yeah. Very good. So uh, the question was, um, well, okay, how is Martin Luther, he seems to have rejected tradition one. How is he different from the, some dude in the, in the sticks with his Bible? Um, you know, you must have read my notes because I'm actually going to, that's the very next thing I'm going to address. So Scott, I'll give you your payment later. Uh, yeah, so that's actually where I'm going next. But to wrap up, uh, I think Alistair McGrath, um, scholar at Oxford who wrote on this stuff, said, Tradition Zero placed the private judgment of the individual above the corporate judgment of the Christian church concerning the interpretation of Scripture. So that describes Tradition Zero. Um, Keith Matheson says, uh, What we observe in the Reformation is not Scripture versus tradition. Instead, it is the inevitable clash between two mutually exclusive concepts of tradition, tradition one and tradition two. The reformers strongly asserted the position term tradition one, and in reaction, Rome adopted and eventually dogmatized the Council of Trent, 1540s, tradition two. And um, to get to, to, to Austin's question, okay, how do we understand uh, the, the, the reformers and their understanding. So that's what I would like to dive into now. Um, so we begin with Martin Luther, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just read my notes. Okay, L listen to this. I think there is much misunderstanding regarding Luther's thought of the relationship between Scripture and tradition. Uh, he took a stand against tradition and held up sola scriptura, by which is understood the Bible free from any tradition. Uh, his famous quotes, his most famous quotes um, are used, which occurred at the Diet of Worms in 1521, where he says, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience would be neither right nor safe. God help me. And then usually what's added is, here I stand, I can do no other. He likely did not say that, but it just sounds so good. You hate to remove that. Um, this and the nailing of the 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg uh, is really about the extent of what many know about Luther. Um, 
yeah, I, in my experience, and and just even very recently, um, I have heard both of these incidents with um, Luther used to suggest that Luther was fleeing, uh, was was freeing the Bible from tradition. That that was what it was about. Um, that it was the Bible verse tradition. Uh, however, we're we're gonna look more to what Luther said here. The issue was not, and this is to answer your question, Austin, um, and I'm going to supply, I'm going to give the conclusion up front. Um, the issue was for Luther was not tradition versus the Bible. The issue was the infallibility of any other tradition, of popes and councils and um other things of that nature, we're going to see he, he actually upheld them, even in his catechism. I'm going to read some stuff from his catechism. But those are fallible, he said. Uh, he was rejecting tradition, too, that there's another infallible source. Uh, he said, no, only the, the written word of God, the Bible, is the infallible uh, rule. And Sola Scriptura upheld that. It wasn't scripture versus tradition. It was scripture is the only infallible uh, word and everything else why, why, while valid was fallible. That's what it was. Um, so, and this also you know, answers the, the question I started with um, just to get ahead of myself here because it's taken a while to answer this question. Remember the dispute between Luther and Erasmus about, okay, both of them are saying sola scriptura, the Bible's the, the sole uh, final supreme authority, the sole final authority for um, faith and practice, only the sole infallible authority for faith and practice. But they came to different conclusions from the Word of God. Both are saying this is what the Word of God says, and that can't be true. You can't, the word of God's not going to say something contradictory. So the question became, since the Pope was rejected as, as having this infallible authority, who gets to decide? Who gets to settle this dispute? And the way the Reformers answered it was Tradition 1, specifically as expressed in the Confessions of Faith. And so that's kind of where we're going. So Luther and his larger catechism, so before I start reading some of this stuff, the one thing I'm trying to show you from this is how much of an importance they placed on the corporate church. They placed a huge importance on the church. I'm going to read some stuff that's going to make you uneasy, but this is stuff that the reformer said. So we'll explain it, but I think just even reading this stuff and your spiny senses go up, I think it does show and reveal how much tradition zero has affected our day. Okay? Um, so in his larger catechism, he writes, uh, what do you mean by the words, I believe in the Holy Spirit? So this is referring to uh, the creed um, that they would confess in their worship service. He writes, uh, you can answer, I believe the Holy Ghost makes me holy, and as his name implies. But whereby does he accomplish this? Or what are his methods and means to this end? Answer, what do you think the answer is? Church, okay, how would have you thought to have answered that? How does the Holy Spirit accomplish this? Through probably me reading the Bible, right? Which is valid, but that's not the emphasis of the Reformers. Uh, Luther answers, by the Christian church. For the first place, he has a peculiar congregation in the world, which is the mother that begets and bears every Christian through the word of God, which he reveals and preaches, and through which he illumines and enkindles hearts, that they understand, accept it, cling to it, and persevere in it. So what I want to point out is Luther is emphasizing the Christian church through which the Holy Spirit works. And um, today we really do tend to we really do tend to focus on the individual. And the reason for that, it, it, nothing fell out of the sky. 
The reason for that is because of a shift philosophically in, in the way we think. And really, it, it was a shift that the modern unbelieving philosophers promoted that the church gradually began to embrace. And that's where it kind of started to obscure the work of the Reformation. Um, Luther said later, We do not act fanatically as, it, as the sectarian spirits do. We do not reject everything that is under the dominion of the Pope. For in that event, we should also reject the Christian church. Did your spiny senses go up? Yes. This is Luther's more mature thought. Why would Luther say that? Chris, you want to take a stab at it? Okay, a concern for throwing the baby out of the bathwater. You're, you're definitely on the right track. Can you explain that a bit more? <laughs> That's okay. I'll just repeat everything you say. I'll be on the internet forever. <laughs> Chris Humphrey, date of birth. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> go, go ahead. I don't even know what your date of birth is, so you're fine. <laughs> Social security number. No. <laughs> Okay, so very good. So essentially, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater because it wasn't as if the whole thing was apostate. And so this is what Luther's saying. He said the domain of the Pope. He didn't say the Pope. He said the domain of the Pope. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay, very good. Yeah, so Kim said uh, Luther's intention was not to implode the church, but to reform it. Hence, that's why they're called reformers. And so it was their conviction that there is one holy Catholic lowercase c church. The gates of hell have never prevailed against it. This is why they wanted to reform it. Um, so the domain of the Pope, the domain of the Pope, not the Pope, but the domain of it, which was the Christian church. So let's say this is, you know, this represents the domain, which is the Christian church. And I don't know, how do you draw that headdress that he wears? I don't even know. Let's, it's just going to look like a baker's hat. I don't care. Um, that, just, that doesn't even look like a baker's hat. I, this is, okay. You know what? Rain cloud on hell. I could draw clouds, but hope. Okay. Did I spell it right? I did. <laughs> so Luther believed that the, the gates of hell had never prevailed against the, the church. There's one church. The reformers did not believe in a Roman Catholic church. The reformers did not believe in a Roman Catholic church. And sometimes um, when you say that, that Rome didn't become Rome until the 1540s, people will hear, what are you talking about? There is no Roman doctrine or pope before that? No, there was Roman doctrine in the pope before that, but there was no Roman Catholic church that the uh, reformers broke off of to start their own thing. Rather, they wanted to reform the church. They took a stand. Rome took a stand, and they took a stand on error. And that is when they um, broke away from the church, even though they claim we're the ones who broke away from the church, you protesters. You guys are just a bunch of noisy, obnoxious protesters. We're the true Catholics. 
you guys are not. And the reformers said, no, we're Catholic. You guys are Roman. You guys are Papists. They were always very careful to call them Papists, Romanish, whatever you want to call it, but they did not call them Catholic. And so what Luther wanted was, okay, let's say we have some, uh, let's, we'll just say Roman doctrine. And really, um, we should call it medieval corruption. So let's say M-E. So you did have uh, corruptions rising. So you, had, you started with some mold and it just kept rising and rising and rising. And the reformers said, we need to get rid of this. And so what, what Luther said in his quote was not, we need to blow up this whole thing. Rather, he said, we need to get rid of the Pope and this Roman doctrine. Because the church needs to be freed from that. Not that we need to blow up the whole thing and start, start, start anew. Because they believed in one Catholic church. The gates of hell has not prevailed and will, will never prevail against the Catholic Church, even though there's been a lot of corruption that's formed. Hence, that's why they're called reformers. They're reforming the church. So they're not blowing it up. They're reforming it. So that's what, that's what Luther was getting at. He, sa he said we need a dispense of the papacy, false doctrine, and false worship. He says we're not like the sectarians. Do you know who he's referring to the, when he says the sectarians? He's referring to the radical reformers, as they were called. The, the radical reformers were, were, were Anabaptists, um, Thomas Munster, uh, Quakers, and, and the Quakers didn't exist around that time of Luther, but they're still in that same kind of mindset and group. The radical reformers held the tradition zero. We just want to uphold the Bible and the Bible only aside from any uh, tradition. We don't care what anyone has said before. We want to blow up the whole thing and start our own thing. Uh, they were, these radical reformers were much different than the magisterium reformers such as Luther and Calvin. Magisterium refers to Two things. One, uh, those uh, the, re the the reformers who had support from the, the the magistrate, the civil magistrate, and then two, at least early on, and then two, uh, magister re refers to teacher. So they they really focused on the teaching of the church up to that point, but they wanted to reform some aspects of it. So, in other words, they wanted to reform the, the church. Whereas the radical reformers, and really that's, radical reformers is not, they're really not, maybe reform is not the right word for them, but in any case, they wanted to really do away with everything and start their own thing. And they held the tradition zero. Uh, just, you just got to believe the Bible. We just, we want to so uphold the Bible. We don't care what others have said in the past. It's what our interpretation is. Um, tr all tradition is bad. And all became heretics. They all denied orthodoxy. They denied the tri based on that hermeneutic. They denied they denied uh, the Trinity. They denied doctrine of God. And they denied doctrine of Christ. Like all the work of the church before that, they rejected and denied and started their own thing and became. They're they're all heretics. They all denied orthodoxy. But they said, who cares about orthodoxy? We just believe the Bible. So those are the radical reformers, and Luther says we're not them. In fact, do you know why our Confession of Faith of 1689 was written? And really, the, the, the confession before that, the 1644, the first London Baptist Confession of Faith, was written? The reason why it was written, this, uh, the first London Baptist Confession of Faith, is because uh, these... Uh, believers who came out of the Puritan school. They were trained at Cambridge. They weren't the Anabaptists out in the, you know, the sticks with their Bibles. Um, they wanted to show that they were not sectarians. They wanted to show that they were not the, the, the Anabaptists who were out there um, 
rejecting the church. They said, we are reforming the church. We just, con we just continued to reform it in the area of one of the sacraments being baptism. That was really important to them. That's explicitly stated in the First London Baptist Confession of Faith. That is why they wrote it. They want to say, we are just, we, we, we are part of the church. We are not wanting to break away from it. And then even in the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, or 1689 as we call it, um, they said, we have no desire, or we have no um, itch to clog religion with new words. This was very important to them. We are not breaking away from the church. We're seeking to reform it, and we've brought further reform in, in their mind. That, that is, they are trying to distinguish themselves from uh, the radical reformers. Those radical reformers who also claim sola scriptura, but they said, no, we're not them. We're here. Uh, this is why Luther says what he says here, and really that was the spirit of the Reformation. Like, yeah, we're not saying the Pope has authority. He needs to go, but that domain, the Christian church that he has taken over and thinks and has exalted himself, uh, taking his seat in the, the temple, exalting himself as, as uh, um, God, really, uh, we reject, but we don't reject the Christian church. Um, are there any, well, let me, let me read this. Um, so, this is Keith Matheson. He's, I don't have his book up here, but he's the one who wrote The Shape of Sola Scriptura. He says, uh, it must be kept in mind that Luther did not reject the true Catholic lowercase c tradition. He rejected certain traditions. In the 16th century, the plural term traditions was universally used to refer to customs and ceremonies. So ceremonies were things like um, you would come in and you would cross yourself. You would bow to the east before the, the minister would get up. Uh, he would climb the stairs to the pulpit. He would be crossing himself. Um, even form prayers. That, that, were, that was all included in that. They wanted to get rid of that, but they did not get rid of tradition in every sense. Uh, Matheson goes on to say, therefore, when Luther responded to the Diet of Worms, he was denying the supreme and infallible authority of the Pope. He was not attacking the authority of the church itself. He was doing what numerous theologians had been doing for over a century. Luther's assertion that scripture was the only infallible authority in matters of faith and his historical criticisms of the papacy and certain traditions did not mean that he advocated a rejection of the communion of the saints. It, it, to, to break away from the church is to deny uh, we believe in the communion of the saints. That's why that phrase is important. That would be to reject the faith. He did not reject that. Neither did he reject the rule of faith. Uh, so the debate was really, so to get to your question, Austin, you set this up very well. The debate was, what is the infallible authority? That's the debate. What is the infallible authority? Not, are there any other authorities, albeit fallible? Are there any other traditions, exegetical? Is there an exegetical tradition, albeit fallible? Rather, the question is, what was the infallible authority? In fact, Luther, the, way, the reason why Luther came to the conclusions he did is because he was reading Augustine. He was reading the early church fathers. So when they were reading uh, scripture, so Romans 4, 5, that God justifies the ungodly, they interpreted justify there as God makes righteous the, the ungodly. Um, God... Uh, the, 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 old, the, the old Franciscan path. Let's see if I can remember it. Um, God does not deny grace to those that do what is in themselves. To those that do what is in themselves, God does not deny grace. So you have the ability, you have the capacity to cooperate with God's grace in order to produce righteousness and holiness. And those who do that successfully, God justifies. 
Um, so God justifies the ungodly in the sense that you're ungodly, but if you do what is, what's in yourself to become godly, then God justifies you, which, of course, we reject. But that was some of the corruption growing in the medieval church. They were believing that. Um, it was really common to believe that during the medieval church. And so everyone was reading the Bible, but they were doing it through le a lens. Um, and when I say everyone's reading the Bible, I'm not saying everyone had a private Bible. I'm just saying that the doctors of the church, as they're called, teachers, were, were reading the scriptures. Um, it wasn't just the Pope saying everything and nobody had a Bible. It was there were, there were a lot of teachers in the church that were reading it, teaching it. But through the lens of that medieval corruption... Well, Luther, he reads Augustine as he's lecturing on the Psalms, Psalm 51. I was conceived in my uh, mother's womb uh, in sin. And then Augustine starts explaining from the scriptures original sin. And Luther's like, wait a minute, what he's saying is makes sense. Yeah, that lines up with scripture. And so all this, like you need to do what's in yourself is, is, is a hoax. And he started to teach that. And so in a lot of sense... It was recovery of, of patristics of the early church. That, and they, they, were, they, they, they recovered that, and then they started to build on that. That's really what it was. It wasn't this tradition. Nobody read the Bible. Suddenly, everyone reads the Bible and says, Aha! <laughs> now we know the truth. Rather, it was that they had these lens, the clouded lens through which they were reading the Bible, reading the early church fathers in Augustine, even though they didn't get everything right, was kind of like wiping the lens and being like, oh, wait a minute. No, that's what the Word of God says. And then, then that's when the Reformation started to um, take shape. So really, the, the Reformers themselves believed that what they were doing was recovering early church doctrine and patristic doctrine and rejecting Pope and the papacy and and um, some of this medieval corruption. Did I see a hand go up? Yes, Patrick. Yeah, so the question uh, was, so first you made a comment that you don't believe all Anabaptists are heretics. Are you, are, can you name me one Anabaptist who wasn't a heretic? Okay. 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 Yeah, which they did do. 
Like justification, yeah. Yeah, it's a trinity. Um, yeah, I mean, if you could find me an Anabaptist who didn't deny that, I'd yeah, be, be happy to look at that. Um, yeah, so this, the second question is, uh, what... Um, so you have you have um, you have two groups, and Pado Baptism and Credo Baptism was used as both are pointing back to a tradition, um, and yet we would call them a true church. And I think one we define true church as a church that um, doesn't deny. I think you're right, the rule of faith. Um, so the Mormons we would say are not a true church because. They don't believe in the, the the God is revealed in Scripture. They don't believe in uh, Christ, even though they they label him as such. Um, but as far as credo baptism and pedo baptism concerns, I think which I, I think um, we don't want to draw a non sequitur, which is if if we hold to tradition one, everyone's going to agree, and that's that's just not the case. Um, this is why you have groups uh, of people that inter- they still interpret the scripture differently. This is why there's different confessions of faith. We don't hold to the Westminster, even though we respect our, our and the, or the Savoy, even though we respect our, our Pado Baptist brothers. Um, we differ on that. Now, obviously, both can't be right, but just because both hold to tradition zero or solo scriptura doesn't mean that everyone's going to come away with the right interpretation. So we differ on that. Um, uh, so the question is, does this framework speak on uh, only basic tenets of orthodoxy? Um, if you're looking at it from a pragmatic point of view, um, yeah, you could, you could say that. Um, but I think more than that, there's a distinction between what is Catholic, that is universal, and that's not every doctrine. Uh, the, the creeds represent things you must believe to be a Christian. The confessions represent um, what you ought to believe that represents the, uh, the correct interpretation of Scripture according to a corporate judgment of the church. The problem is, really, what what the, what what the problem is? We no longer have a like you, what you had during the the, the creeds. One ch- one church apart from denominations. Now today you have various denominations. You have various traditions. Um, but in the differences, the differences represent things that. Don't put you outside the thing. Uh, what makes somebody Catholic, Laura KC, is to believe, as you put it, the rule of faith, or to believe that apostolic faith. If you don't believe that, yes, you are outside the church, and that's where tradition one has most effectively worked. Um, really because of tradition zero, that you ended up with a bunch of cults in the 19th century. Um, because everybody's like, apart from any ecclesiastical authority, apart from any things that have gone before us, um, we decide that we're just going to get a private revelation or private interpretation and start our own thing. With regards to credo baptism versus pedo baptism, for example, um, there's good historical evidence that it was credo baptism, believers' baptism, the first several centuries uh, of the church. Now, again, there's debate over that. Like, um, Oh, I can't think of his name. The, the, the guy who said, for 86 years I've served the Lord, and he's never done me any wrong. And some will use that to indicate pedo baptism. Um, there was pedo baptism even in the early church, um, even though they would recognize that they did it for wrong reasons, really to wash away original sin, to make sure that that baby is saved because the infant mortality rate was so high. Um, there's, there's doctrinal thesis and disagreements over this, scholars debate over this. So one scholar, who's a Scottish Presbyterian, says he believes uh, Augustine universalized paedo-baptism with his 
uh, doctrine of original sin, because he himself wasn't baptized as a baby. So there's debate over what is, what is even the tradition in the early church. So paedobaptism and credobaptism is kind of um, a different animal in a way. But I think we have to be careful by saying tradition one resolves all disagreements. It, it doesn't. All tradition one says is there's a... We want to interpret the Bible corporately, because even our confession of faith is that, interpreting the Bible corporately. The problem is you have different corporate uh, gatherings or different corporate beliefs in that. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, if you think I'm making the point that a pragmatic point, like this is going to work, it's, that's not the point I'm making. But what, what, I'm, what I am saying is that um, this, is what, this is how the Reformers viewed Tradition one, and therefore sola scriptura. Any other questions or, or comments? Yes, Chris. Well, okay, so, um, I, so I see what you're saying, because in, sometimes in practice, that's the way it is, but scripture, they would still affirm scripture is supreme, but they would say the individual, then, and, and not even, if even, the corporate uh, judgment of the church. Yeah, so the corporate, right. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're gonna we're gonna start looking at some of the philosophical trajectory and on the the um, the focus on the individual as deciding all matters. Um, you know, uh, there's and this is gonna help us understand our culture today. So one of the beliefs that came about, but really the the overall belief is get away get rid of all external forms. Get rid of all ex anything external, because that is going to prevent the individual from expressing his authentic self. So this is uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, Immanuel Kant applied this to ecclesiastical. Uh, so he's he's a modern he's a secular modern philosopher applying this to ecclesiastical thing. And he has no right to do that, but he's the one that says you sort of of uh, ordered form. That kills the individual's authentic self. It leads to dead orthodoxy. Um, and then you just keep tracing that out down the road. And now today we have somebody that says, I'm a, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. This external thing has kept me in. Um, but then that also applies to hermeneutics. Because um, there's a, I'm getting ahead of myself, but there's a man named Jowett. Uh, who is over, of course, in, in the uh, across the pond? That's usually it starts there and it comes over here. Um, who said the way of interpretation, the way of interpreting the Bible, is to get rid of all interpretation. And his views were widely accepted and spread. So, in other words, the way to interpret the Bible is to get rid of all interpretation, like any sort of exegetical conclusion. Get rid of, and it's just the individual with the Bible alone. And so that. That, all of this plays in, into this. I'm trying to show the Reformers really thought differently the, than this. Um, look briefly at John Calvin. Uh, John Calvin also holds to the common belief that the church um, is, is extremely important. He says, let us learn, so this comes from his institutes, uh, let us learn from the church's single title of mother how useful Nay, how necessary the knowledge of her is, since there is no other means of entering into life unless she conceive us in the womb and give us birth, unless she nourish us at her breast, and in short, keep us under her charge and government. Moreover, 
beyond the pale of the church, no forgiveness of sins, no salvation can be hoped for, as Isaiah and Joel testify. So what he's saying is the church is the pillar and support of the truth. Um, the, the, the word of God is declared in uh, the church. And the church then uh, raises up these children. Uh, think about Ephesians 4. How do you mature? It says, we all, uh, speaking the truth in love, are to grow up into one head and one body. And so they're using um, places such as those. This is what he says on, on tradition or councils. Uh, listen to what he says. The, the, the councils, uh, and, I, um, and I think he's thinking specifically about the seven ecumenical councils, that the councils would come to have the majesty that is their due, yet in the meantime, Scripture would stand out in the higher place. So again, Scripture is the supreme authority. With everything subject to its standard, in this way, we willingly embrace and reverence as holy the early councils such as those of Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus 1, Chalcedon, and the like, which were concerned with refuting errors, insofar as they relate to the teachings of the faith. For they contain nothing but the pure and genuine exposition of Scripture, which the Holy Fathers applied, so again, the early church, applied with spiritual prudence to crush the enemies of religion who had then arisen. So again, Calvin's affirming that the ultimate authority, the supreme authority of the Bible, but then he's saying these, these creeds, the, the councils, he, calls, he, he says we are to revere them as holy. It's Calvin in his institute saying that. Because they have an authoritative place in the life of the church under Scripture, but expand, expounding Scripture and giving us these conclusions against uh, heretics, against those who... Uh, promoted error. And so he says, and this gets to the question, um, how, who handles disputes? He goes on to say, if any discussion arises over doctrine, the best and surest remedy is for a synod of true bishops to be convened uh, where the doctrine at issue may be examined. For although we hold that the word of God alone lies beyond the sphere of our judgment, and that fathers and councils are of authority only insofar as they accord with the rule of the word, we still give to councils and fathers such rank and honor as it is meet for them to hold under Christ. And uh, he rejects that they are infallible, contra Rome. That was the argument of Rome. Rome says, no, they're infallible. He said, no, they're fallible, but we still hold them in high regard because of the pure uh, exposition of God's word. Um, it's not God's word, it's the exposition of it. But he uh, to just wrap up, Alistair McGrath, the scholar, puts it well. He says, although it is often suggested that the reformers had no place for tradition in their theological deliberations, this judgment is clearly incorrect. So it's a common belief uh, that then these scholars and these writers are all recognizing that. Um, that this, this thinking that the Reformers had no place for tradition in their theological deliberations. While the notion of tradition as an extra scriptural source of revelation is excluded, so this infallible tradition too, the classic concept of tradition as a particular way of reading and interpreting scripture is retained. Okay, are there any questions or comments? Because we are out of time. Yes, Luke. Or, uh, yes, Luke. <laughs> Shouldn't we be called Trinity Reformed Catholic Church? Oh, that would be confusing. <laughs> but yes, that's what we, you know what? That's actually what we want to be, Reformed Catholics. You know, William Perkins, uh, he wrote um, a lengthy uh, a treatise on Reformed Catholicity, being a Reformed Catholic. He says that's what we are. Um, we're Catholic. We hold to the, the, the one true church. But we wanted to reform it. We wanted to remove all the corruptions from it that actually doesn't make it 
pathway. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, well, you are dismissed.